Quote, we now know that our ancestors brought with them something that not even the slave trade could take away, their own distinctive strands of DNA. And because their DNA has been passed down to us, their direct descendants, it just might be the key that unlocks our African past. End quote. Henry Louis Gates, head of Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. You know, we all search for a sense of self, a sense of belonging, a sense of self-esteem. It's one of the main questions of what it means to be human, to ask, who am I? Where do I come from? Why am I here? I come from a people, a people who had distinctive language, distinctive culture, distinctive spiritual practices, and civilization. They are part of who I am. Their strands of DNA are still present in my flesh and blood, and I am on a journey to bring it full circle to those ancestors. Those ancestors who were stolen, kidnapped, forced from the islands off the coast of West Africa by greedy slave traders, both of both of their own countrymen and the European slave traders. There are some in reading history and the more that I study about the slave trade, West African West African history, American Afri- African American history, but thinking about some of the happenings that that took place during the slave trade, I think about those ancestors who some of them had to make a month or a little bit longer, a month to a few months trek through the inlands of that particular area along the coast to the coast. Then from that trek, those who survived that, to be held in the horrid jail stockade conditions. And in some cases, which I've seen in watching documentaries, they were quote unquote blessed by, you know, with holy water by the Catholic priests to get onto the boat. It was like blessing the cargo. But from those stockade conditions onto the torturous experience of being stocked on the slave ships, then to endure the horrors of the Middle Passage. There were some who preferred to end their lives. They would rather just end their lives than than cross the Atlantic. There were attempted rebellions aboard ships before they set sail. There were many thousands who died and litter the Atlantic coast along the way to the Americas. And those who survived to the shores of the Americas, I and lots of people in my family descend from those survivors. I have always been interested in learning about other cultures, their languages, the way they move about and function in their society and community. But for the longest time in my teen and early 20s, to learn about Africa was at the bottom of my list of cultures. And this is what happens to a people or a person who has never heard or seen one good thing about a large continent. Africa was never spoken about in my family. Slavery was... An embarrassment, I gathered and I felt a disgrace. And many Americans of African descent just wanted it to go away. But nothing of this grave a nature ever just goes away. It will come up again and again until we fully engage with and deal with it and accept it in all of its pain and horror. What I read about and hear from people who grew up in the 60s on was that nobody wanted to be African. Africa was talked about and portrayed by Hollywood and the media as primitive. They would show the pygmies. 
they would portray um, Africans in barbaric behavior. And up until the present day, Africa is seen as poor, famine ridden, a place where one place no pride, especially if you're descended from there. And all you see and hear about Africa is what is being portrayed and poured into you through history books and media. It takes a lot of digging and reading. And these days with the Internet, there's more connection. So you have sort of no excuse to be able to connect with people from Africa and Africa as a continent in more ways than were possible before the Internet. There have been in in our American history, though, and in African history, brief periods where there were small bursts of African pride and where there were connections were being made across the ocean. And they called it the transatlantic loop. They were sharing arts and music and literature. And there was this like swell of pride for being of African descent and being connected to Africa. And I feel like we are living through another one of those bursts in this present time, in this moment. But I hope this time it will not simply be a fad, but something that fosters deep and true connection. Thanks to strides in genetics after centuries of separation, many of us are eager and anxious to re- reconnect with that past and with those distant cousins, aunties, uncles, fathers, mothers, as it were. Before I took this ancestry DNA test, I, watching YouTube videos, watching documentaries, um, Henry Louis Gates is finding your roots. I predicted that as an African-American born and raised in the South with parents going far back in the South, as far as my great, great, grandmother that I know I predicted that I would be somewhere between 75% and 80% African and around maybe like 19 20ish percent European and maybe a few other percent something else sprinkled in there I don't know Native American because you hear oh my everybody has a my someone grandpa or grandma were Native American <laughs> in their in their like story of their family but according to ancestry dna my ethnicity breakdown is as follows and when i got the email of my results which the test was simple enough to do you send your saliva in um in, in the solution and it takes about um maybe four to eight weeks or six to eight weeks to get your results back. But I got mine back in about four weeks, I think. But when I got these results, I just opened, I clicked on the link and I saw the percentages and I just stared at it for like a long time off and on. But so here's a breakdown of the percentages of what I am. And of course, this is through my side, my mom's side, and it goes kind of trace back my mom's or just sort of, you know, my mother's side DNA. Since girls are XX, they carry their moms. And in order to know what my father is, I would need either his DNA or someone, uh, a male who's related to him. But 77% of my ancestors are from the Great Pork Chop. Hey, from Africa. And that's putting it mildly, calling it the Great Pork Chop. But a land filled with, continent filled with natural resources, full of dynamic, diverse cultures, civilizations, boundless beauty of flora, fauna, and animals I have never even heard of. And of that 77%, are you ready for this? The highest percentage, and I thought it would be kind of like broken up in like this equal percentage of like a scattery just group along that West Coast. But to my surprise, 
<laughs> the highest percentage comes from, are you ready? And it's funny because I was hoping for one country over another because I was thinking, oh, this country, just the people there seem calm and yeah, they have people who were fighters in their history and this and that, but they just seem more calm and more less like grasping and money hungry and um, flashy. And so, ah, oh, please let me be from this culture. But then I get it, get the percentages back and the highest percent, percent which is 29%, comes from Nigeria. Leading the way with 29%. So exciting. But it's funny that the few times I've had dreams or recurring dreams, the few that I've had about Africa, it's been about Nigeria in this weird way. I was like, in this dream that I've had a couple of times, I was flying on a plane and the pilot says, you're here and you can land. And I parachute down like out of the plane. I don't know why. <laughs> why I'm not just landing on the ground. But in each of those dreams, I was like, I had to jump out of the plane and I'm parachuting down in this parachute with several others. <laughs> and we're like flying over and I look out and at all this like red land, terracotta, terracotta, however you say that, this red um, earth of Nigeria. But that that's interesting that that's the highest percentage. So 29% Nigeria 16% Cameroon and Congo, 14% Ivory Coast and Ghana, which is where I wanted to be from, Ghana. <laughs> I'm like, please let it be the most from Ghana. But I'm loving that it's Nigeria as well. And Nigeria is a mixture of so many. And of course, these um, countries that as we know them today, and they're sort of loose borders, were not sort of bordered off countries. They are filled with different ethnicities, different tribes, thousands of languages. Um, so these places are vastly diverse. But so 14% Ivory Coast Ghana, Mali 7%, and 11% of that 77% are trace regions. So, and of those trace regions, which kind of means that you have like traces of these particular um, groups in your DNA. And the trace regions are Senegal, 4%, Benin, Togo, 4%, Africa Southeastern Bantu, 2%, and Africa North, less than 1%. And then I have, which I wasn't expecting to find not 1% on here, but 4% Native American. So according to this breakdown the four percent and, and it ranges up to five percent in the range is native american so maybe my mom was right after all but i don't want to take that just yet because if you if an african african-american has about if an african i think only about five percent of african-americans have um I think, it, I don't know, I read this somewhere. Maybe I'll get into that a little bit later. Maybe I have it written down here in my notes. But if you have about 5%, which is a lot for Af um, Af blacks of African descent here in America, that means that you have at least one grandmother within the last 120 to 200 years of your ancestry. But that was very inter interesting. And then 19% European. So that was kind of close. But thinking about my ancestors, they were a people of great fortitude. They had to be a people of great fortitude and resilience. And we who carry their genes today are made of some mighty star stuff, like the astrophysicists like to say. But for me, knowing this sliver of information is one piece of the puzzle of understanding the strength, the loss, the legacy of a people. 
and act in the process of reaching for that wholeness that I'm always yearning for and reaching for. As an adult, especially after giving birth to my own children, I think about ancestry a lot. And as Maya Angelou says, quote, it resides with us and will continue to do so. And we have to be vigilant and not pretend that it's just something in the past so long ago, you know, to sort of get over it. Both blacks and whites are responsible for rooting it out of our psyche, end quote, and in her giving her thoughts on our connection with Africa and how we feel about blackness and where that comes from. Taking a simple DNA test that gives you pertinent and, you know, but general information on where you come from, I felt excited. I felt nervous. I wanted to cry. That may sound silly, but these are all the feelings that I felt just by simple DNA. But just opening the link to the results pr produced all of these emotions. I just, like, again, like I stated before, I just stared at the results for a long time, taking it all in, thinking about how much more in depth I want to go in studying the history of African countries, regions that show up in the pie graph, to study more of the African diaspora. My soul smiled, if that makes sense. Information can be very powerful. And just having this give me sort of just like this ghostly grasp into the past. Having a little bit more of, my, of information of my family's origin and hopefully gaining more specifics in the future. If anyone's listening and have funds to donate, I'll definitely take it for me to go deeper and get more specific with tests. Because there are certain tests that you can do to kind of pinpoint what area and that you can that will help you put names to your family tree, but just certain tests that will help you pinpoint like exactly which tribe, which area um, the most, and it will get other, other women, for example, doing mitochondrial DNA, other women from your mother's line in your family to do DNA, and it can kind of help you get more specific and narrow the, the, the gap. But having this information and going deeper with it will aid in healing the wounds of being ripped away from Africa. It will heal the wounds of the Middle Passage and be able to stand more, allow me and other Africans who are Blacks of African descent, American Blacks, to stand more deeply, more confidently and securely in the American tradition. And by standing more confidently in that tradition, then you will continue to be able to reach out even more securely and confidently with other peoples and their histories and their traditions. It's funny, I ask so many questions, of course, as you guys know, but I ask questions to friends I meet from Ghana and Nigeria, some of the few that I have relationships with. And I asked them questions like what they were taught in their country about the slave trade. I asked them about their schools, their weddings, their funerals, languages. What are the conflicts between class and tribes? Um, what impacts have colonizations had on their way of life and their culture? What they love about their country? And what are, the, some, of the, th what are some of the things that they desperately would love to see changed about their countries and I get a variety of answers and some people obviously are not as interested as I am about <laughs> um, culture and and they don't really think about it that much because you know you're you're in it and you're of it but there are other people who give thoughtful answers and I find that very encouraging but I love asking those questions and getting you know a variety of responses strange looks to Yes, let me tell you, open arms. But even though we here in the United States of America have a culture and a very distinct one that doesn't become, that didn't become more vivid to me at least until or unless you spend time among groups of immigrants or and mostly when you travel abroad, when you spend a significant amount of time outside of your country outside of 
touristy areas and increasingly traveling. I'm sure a lot of places are very just, I don't know, westernized in a way. So in some cases, you just really have to kind of go out of your way to travel to not just kind of be bombarded by the boredom of sameness of having the, you know, the mighty Western civilization that, that has its tentacles everywhere. But listening to the answers of my African sisters and brothers, I didn't realize just how much we have been starved of and have lost African culture. But cultures grow, they change, they evolve, and for good reason. And it makes me think about a story I've heard from the um, author, I think it was Chimamanda Ngochi Adichie, who was having a talk, but she was talking about culture in Nigeria. And she was saying how not too long ago in Nigerian history, they would kill twins when they were born because somehow someone got it in their heads that two babies out of the womb at one time was evil, like not normal and not sure of all the I'm not sure of all the history behind that. I'd be interested to know what that was all about, but but that it that's that was just one of example of how cultures can grow, need to grow, need to change and need to be in contact with other cultures. And I can give many examples in American culture about American culture as well. That's just just as backwards, but it shows why cultures should change and grow and evolve. So, yeah, realizing about out how much of that African culture and history have been ripped away and deprived, like we've been deprived of that. And there are exceptions in America. Uh, I think about the origin of the Gullah culture on the southeast coast of North Carolina and northeast Florida or southeast North Carolina and northeast Florida, which was the Gullah region, which has slowly, of course, been sort of gentrified in a way. They're kind of taking their land and building hotels and tourist spots. But I think about those people who have been able to preserve much of their African culture and heritage because of climate, geography, and patterns of importation of enslaved Africans. I think about the Creoles and, you know, Louisiana and all that the bayou area, and there are certain little pockets of of Blacks, um, American, of African descent that has been able to keep um, a substantial amount of their culture up until this day. And of course, we do have different cultures. Blacks in the South have a different and distinct way of being than Blacks in the North, and then Blacks in the west or midwest like we're all different and distinct and dynamic even here and at the risk of sounding like i'm romanticizing i I don't want to do that well don't get me wrong there's so much that needs to be weeded out in the colonized west african countries the whole idea of straight hair, which my friend from Nigeria was saying how, you know, she has locks and then she goes to Nigeria for a wedding or whatnot. She has to put on a straight wig and, you know, to wear your hair natural, like how it grows out of your head is like, ugh, why would you do that? <laughs> like, I mean, that's just, but America was there, you know, in the past. And I feel like in a way, just with the straight hair and the skin bleaching that's big in in West Africa, not just in West Africa, but in um, India as well, um, a sort of worship of the westernized culture. And in some ways, those who have been educated abroad, they get it. Um, And I get it. And I understand it because the West has accumulated so much wealth and been empire dominant for a while now. Um, We have had the comfort and the wealth to have a sort of organization and infrastructure. Um, We've had oppressed groups um, and throughout history fight for certain human rights and laws that are still not existent or in the works in other developing quote unquote countries. Um, 
But I think about those things and how strong that that culture can be or social social relationships can be to where you can come, you know, come to the West or any place where you that you have encouragement and being inspired to love who you are, your skin color and all of its glory and the hair that grows out of your head, the way you were created for it to grow and to love that and to find different and dynamic ways to, you know, use that, you know, aesthetically or whatever, that to go back to a culture that is still kind of backwards in that way and still developing can be a little annoying and discouraging in some ways. Like you have to have a strong constitution and just be, you know, resolved and unbending to stay your course and to help others think about the backwardness um, of that thinking. Another thing that's helping me right now and has helped me is reading fiction from West African writers and listening to lectures and discussions from their intelligentsia. Authors like I mentioned Chimamanda um, from Nigeria, Chinua Achebe, who's from Ogidi Anambra, Nigeria. I said Anambra, like Alhambra, <laughs> thinking about Spain and the Moors, but, but thinking about this author who's a historian um, or uh an intellectual or whatever and then listening to lectures um, conversations and reading um, the works of historian Sheikh Anta Diop of Senegal and even the English novelist Graham Greene but reading these people these authors give me a sense of everyday life how like based you know typical things like how they fall in love and you know the political climate and how it affects society socially etc all those things that you know real lives of real human beings and ha who have real stories and real challenges and real successes it makes Africa and these parts come alive to me I can smell the smells I can feel the heat I can say oh I can be reading a book and say, it's too hot. I don't want to be here or whatever. Or, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Or look at how rich that earth is. Or, oh my gosh, like, you know, like I can read these novels and kind of place myself there and have these reactions. It gives me a sense of just making them come alive, just like history and um, or reading fiction does for me here. But it, so it gives me that deep appreciation and love for African people and their diverse culture. Thinking about coming back to slavery in America, knowing deep down in the marrow of our bones, of my bones, that it was beyond humane. And on the other hand, it was a complex institution. More than anything else, we know that it was a business an enterprise that involved relationship between human beings, albeit relationships between two human beings who could never be equal in that type of setting. The woman and man power that it actually took to build this country is astounding to me. Thinking about my sisters and brothers in the Caribbean, in Brazil, which Brazil have the second largest population of African descendants, just after Nigeria, which has the most, which has the largest population. Reading and studying as much as I do about that part of American history with its very tangible tentacles up to this day, I look at the callousness of people had about human life and it's, it's all, it can almost be unforgettable, unforgivable um, with the stuff that I read. How can you forgive that? I mean, just reading um, slave narratives, reading um, letters and documents from slaveholders, reading the historians, like, it's like, how can you 
forgive that. It's like, how? What it takes, it's beyond me. For me to understand the tragedies and atrocities of this country is a crucial step towards reclaiming that past and constructing a more solid and stable ground to stand on to continually move forward. I think about the resilience of character, the strength of mind it took to endure and survive and still, even to this day, have, even if it's just a small semblance of family, is beyond amazing to me knowing the kind of history and what we've been through in this country. Again, I was listening to the Nigerian author Chimamanda and she was sharing her story of how she, you know, about idealized, um, idealizing America before she came here to study and coming here and realizing for the first time that she was black because there's no such thing in Nigeria. Like everybody's black, varying colors, ranging in blackness with the red tones and gold tones and yellow tones and all that stuff ranging. Okay. But coming here to America and realizing that she was black and then resisting it as she quickly realized being a smart and intelligent woman that to be black in America was at the bottom of American. That means you're at the bottom of American society. And that's what immigrants realize when they first get here. They quickly realize that to be black, that's like the very low, low of the low. There's a hierarchy here. And so when one day on the streets, you know, uh, she went to school up in the Northeast uh, American black male approached her and said, my sister, she recoiled. She said, I recoiled and said, no, no, I'm not your sister. You're not my brother. Like, <laughs> eh, no, 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 I'm not your sister. I, I don't, you're not my brother. And she, <laughs> she, and it wasn't until she started to study. Um, she said, no, she said she writ- she had written an essay in her class and the professor was saying, who is Chimamanda Adichie? Um, They wrote the best essay in the class. And when she raised her hand, she realized that there was shock. And she realized that it was because she was black. And that's when she was like, what? What? I mean, is that the expectation of black people in this country? That, like, that you'll be shocked by an essay being the best in the class? And so from that moment on, she said she started to study African-American history reading lots of books and by lots of authors um, and that she then understood more and wondered why when she first arrived that the whole of America wasn't being burned down by American blacks was beyond her in what she read in her history and she was thinking about how American blacks showed a humongous sense of restraint that she didn't understand the more she studied, she wanted to find out, or the more she studied, the more, well, the more she studied, the more she wanted to find out. She wanted to find that, or she wanted to find that guy who said, hey, my sister, you know, she wanted to find him again and say, yes, yes, hello, my brother, (laughs) you know, after she had read the history, but it took her studying that to realize the depths and how it plays out in society, um, to this day. The perilous act of slavery has never been more tangible mentally for me than it is right now with having uh, just this little nugget of this DNA information. I'm sure it would be even more vivid if I can find more records and documents and place more names on my family tree and have more specific detailed pointed DNA tests to kind of Uh, narrow down that focus of that focal point or as close as I can get because the act of slavery took away names and identity and identities Um, one thing I found out on the small the tiny bit of small amount of paper trail that I have on my family's history is that it's impossible to trace the ancestry of a family of a people really who have only one name, if your name's even written on the, you know, in the register, what was your name? Quote, what was your name and where did it go? End quote, implored Malcolm X in a speech he gave. 
we have a distinct connection to slavery. It's not a fad. We literally and purposefully had our roots cut out from under us. But with modern technology and knowledge, we can make connections and in some cases, direct connections with some people to not only the slave trade, but to those cousins, aunties, and uncles in Africa. One of the guests on the Finding Your Roots series by Henry Louis Gates Jr., I think it was uh, a preacher, T.D. Jakes, but he described his visit to Nigeria. He has friends and relationships there and heavy ancestry through his father's side in particular um, uh, in Nigeria. And he said on visiting Nigeria and meeting with his friends there, he said, quote, it's like a set of twins who were separated at birth, raised in two different parts of the world, and they meet together for the first time. And he said, you're strangely familiar to me, your smile, your laughter. I look in your eyes and I know what you mean, what you are thinking. I swear I know you, but I can't remember where from, end quote. And I thought that is a great sort of analogy of what it can feel like, I'm sure. It reminds me of people who adopted or a little bit of that documentary of those twin sisters who were um, split apart in two different continents who met up um, and met each other, like how they embraced, how they just, there's a part of them that just had that connection and was like, ah, oh, I know you, I know you, I swear I know you, I feel you, your smile, everything is so familiar, but then you realize, gosh, but we are different and we, ha but they still share something so great and so much has been lost, but they're still this connection there that they can forge and build a richer bond from. But there are various aspects. Well, thinking about the various aspects of the complex intertwine of human beings and slavery, um, slavery as an institution changed over time. And it is just, I mean, it really, literally was not that long ago in the span of history, 450 years or so, give or take a little bit, wasn't that long ago. And it is, it was distinct from region to region. There were about 4 million slaves during the time of the Civil War, and there were about 400,000, give or take a few, free Negroes in the South which I didn't know until I read, um, but there was a, a community of free Negroes in the South, um, very small percentage, but they were there. But if you were free, one of those free Negroes, you were in a precarious place. If you were a free black person, you couldn't count on remaining free because you couldn't depend on the law defending that freedom. They had to carry registration around to be known to be free. And sometimes that didn't, oh, excuse me, that didn't pan out. Like they could still take you if they really wanted to, but you had to carry registrations around, around. They had to be monitored. And so freedom for these blacks was very much so not to be taken for granted. So what kind of freedom is that? I mean, yeah, it's better than being a slave, but you're like free in a bubble. Like you, you, you mentally, it's still, I would imagine it still messes you up, but I'm sure it gave many opportunities, um, and abilities to kind of move forward, move up, uh, for a lot of those free blacks who had, um, education and had access to different things. Um, after the Civil War, it allowed them to, um, I guess, be the leaders in, in certain ways. But the majority of our ancestors, I'm, I'm quite sure I probably don't descend from free Negroes, but <laughs> the majority of our ancestors remained in slavery more than 80 years after the Revolution. And Obtaining the details of their lives is very difficult. One of the ways 
to get a true sense of what slavery was like is to pay attention to slaveholders and their wives if they're found or mentioned in the paperwork. That's a, another way to get a sense of what slavery was like. In slave registers that are found, slaves are listed as having no name. The only thing one would find is male or M or F for male or female age and maybe mulatto. If you are mulatto, that means... Um, you know, well, you guys know what that means, but listed right along, they were listed right along with animals, um, that were property. And so the fact that you're listed with property, that you are property, that fact alone has done a lot to undermine our confidence as a people. Laws were written that made it so slaves couldn't form some of the most intimate and stable relationships, but a stubborn and or lucky few most certainly did maintain those relationships. But there was lots of separation. It was hard, loss on loss on loss. And I would imagine every day as a trial in that environment to get up and make it through another day. Um, and they found you know, ways to deal with it, to, to survive, to push through, you know, they had religion, they had kinship bonds and lots of laughter. Those were constant companions. And those were things that, that carried them through and helped them to survive. But it's interesting reading letters and letters slave owners wrote after the civil war saying things like, my people have deserted me. I'm just imagining how detached from reality these slave owners had to be. Like what major cognitive dissonance one would have to have. Like, I mean, that would be like up until today. Can you imagine the wardens of the prison systems that are in place today saying, my people have deserted me. If you let out the millions of prisoners locked away and slaving away in jail right now, like, can you imagine those wardens saying they have deserted me? I mean, I can see how they would say my money's gone or how am I going to, you know, <sighs> collect a paycheck now? Like, but saying my people have deserted me, like, I don't know, that just seems very detached. It has taken a lot of fortitude and strength to succeed, to succeed, really, and be a whole person. And that fractious reaction we can have to, to this past that is ours, that is not that far away, is beyond me. And the, the wanting, it's just, it's just interesting. It also bothers me deeply when... But I understand this as a fan of social studies, how very many of us internalize racism, turning something as subjective or individual and superficial as skin color or hair texture or the shape of our noses and thickness of our lips into such a source of pain and shame. That just bothers me to no end that that still goes on to this very day. But I also, this is something that's not, again, not unique to American Blacks. I see this in non-American Blacks, in the Caribbean, South American, um, from those colonized by the British in West Africa, in India. Like, you know, I see this all over the place. But slavery, America's original sin, along with the genocide of Native American, Native Americans forces us to confront these worst nightmares of our history. It's a painful but necessary part in understanding who we are as a people and who we are as a nation. It's not anything that you quote unquote get over. Like again, how are you supposed to get over something like that? But I'm amazed that you can 
pinpoint a place with more specialized tests and genetics and be able to say, this is where you have risen from. This is where your roots began for you. Because I really and truly think when you are lost as an individual, as a group or a country and do not belong to anything and do not have deep rooted foundations in anything, I have experienced personally and seen throughout history that you will gravitate to people, to environments and things that will continue to strip you of your wholeness. You will move towards that which continues to dampen and damage your soul. It's a testament to the deep strength at the core of a people and a will to just simply survive. And if I'm honest... (laughs) Absolutely astounding to me that we have accomplished anything without knowing where we come from. That is mind boggling. I don't think what I want to, I don't think I want to call what I have found out so far closure, but what I would rather want want to do is recognize that ultimately we all went through it in this country And we all had to survive it. So again, just to sum up, the D analysis, the DNA, the D analysis, (laughs) the DNA analysis suggests that approximately 30% of my African lineage can be traced back to Nigerian origin. Um, And yes, there is a lot of specifics that would need to be addressed for the statement to be complete completely accurate accurate but given the amount of data involved in the margin of error error that's there um you know it might be off a little bit here and there and of course it changes um with family members so I would love to see like what my sisters have and what my mom has but but for the most part you get to narrow it down and that's a pretty high percentage if you ask me And the average African-American has about 20% European ancestry. Um, But knowing these figures, knowing and seeing them break down, for example, Africa and where the general area where you come from, it gives me a sense of identification with a particular cultural group. Um, And... And that experience impacts who I can identify with and what I am. And just thinking about um, Nigerians and how they how they kiss their teeth and how that's something that, you know, growing up you heard and you did with, you know, when you were frustrated, when you're like, I don't believe this person, just like a form of expression, how that same kind of like that little that little quirk happens in uh, the Caribbean and you know like just those little things just kind of show me that oh man like we are connected and we are one and um I'm connected to you even if it's like very loosely in some ways but and of course I can never just say I am Nigerian you know I don't it's not my country and I didn't grow up there. Um, I would have to go there and be a foreigner and be an American, you know, like definitely be seen and known as she's an American black, you know, here and visiting and just soaking it all in and just kind of connecting those parts of my soul, that part of my DNA and bringing it full circle. I would love to go to Ghana, for example. I actually want to go to Ghana, um, first and maybe um some of the different parts of Nigeria not particularly Lagos uh it seems overwhelming I'm not a big city kind of person um like New York I'm not like super excited to oh you want to go to New York no I don't need tons of huge skyscrapers and busyness and lights everywhere like that's overwhelming um to me and my personality but I would love to go to those cities outside of Lagos and I love to go to Ghana and visit um even the place where um WB Du Bois lived and just having friends there and being able to visit their house and just spend time 
with them, connecting with them and just being and being there. Um, I can't wait until someday I'll be able to do that and afford that. I need to get a job ASAP. People, if you know of anyone hiring part-time working overnights, I'm looking for a job anyways to be able to save more money to do more things. But yeah, so that's been my experience. It kind of gives me a little pep in my step. I don't know why, just a little more, a little bit sense of surety and security and firmness, firmly planted. Um, um, and then, yeah, it just makes me think about how great it would be to go back and just let them know, like let my ancestors know when they first got on this shore and how afraid they were, how scared they were, were, um, all the different, gosh, I can't even imagine, um, that mental and emotional turmoil, but it would just be great to go back and let them know. And I'm sure as the years progressed and hundreds of years went by, of course, some people just kind of succumbed to the system. There were always those who were fighting against that, um, having uprisings, um, not, uh, allowing slavery to keep them subdued and but it would just be great to go back and let them know like hey look at what we're doing today and um the steps that we've made and um how we are striving to connect again with you and look at how you know just we've trailed away from you because of obviously painful horrible reasons and not being one to connect to that pain and trauma but we are coming full circle a lot of us and I hope it continues and we can continue to foster that healing and um, wholeness but here we are now we have survived and we're still moving forward Um, but just looking at the cycle of life and that yearning to reconnect with ancestors and with you know, those who came before us, um, who endure, endured that suffering and remained alive and just, I just think that would be so great. So, and then thinking about them, sometimes you feel like, and of course, reading the history that I'm reading and have read, as you just feel like you don't have a right to be tired, like spiritually, you don't have a right to be spiritually tired or soul tired, even though obviously you're a human being and you will be. But thinking about that because of what I come from, um, to continue to fight for freedom and justice for all people, not just Africans and black people, but continuing to fight for that justice and freedom for all people that are oppressed in the ways that we, in our various unique ways that we are able to do that. But I think that as um, American Blacks, one of the greatest gifts we have to give and that we can give to the world, to our country and to the world, is the ability to stand against the unjust, to spot that fakeness um, in, in the games that are played when we see it, to fight for the wholeness of humanity and for anyone who have been so deeply oppressed and are lucky enough to come out of it with some sense of dignity we can give the gift and strength to ourselves one reclaiming our own past and then we'll be able to give more fully more honestly to other people Thank you so much for listening. Keep questioning, keep searching, and keep being awesome.